Seemed like I never quit on these, but we're looking at the patriarchal dispensation, the patriarchal law, and some more aspects of it. But when we tie this in, we'll see how it relates to Christianity as well. The lesson will deal with that as well. We're going to look at laws against murder in the various dispensations. The Bible has three basic dispensations. Uh, the term dispensation is used by denominational people to mean something different than what I'm using it for. The word dispensation is from the Greek word for stewardship. And so there was a stewardship, a dispensation. We have the three dispensations, the patriarchal, the mosaic, or the law of Moses, and the New Testament, the law of Christ. So it's usually, our brethren usually say patriarchal, mosaic, and Christian dispensations. That's usually laid it out. The word, when you look at patriarch, it's the father rule. That's what it means. And so the governing of the, and the leadership in the worship, and the, in the case of the patriarch that was offering animal sacrifices, was through the patriarch, the father of the family, the father of the clan. We look at laws against murder now under these systems, all three of the systems. Murder under the patriarch, or murder under the law of Moses, murder under the New Testament. We're looking at this and how God laid it out for us. Well, there is a lot of misunderstanding about what murder is and what's involved in it. In fact, the translations that we have do not translate it quite as clearly as they should. The King James American Standard are good translations, but they have in the Decalogue, thou shalt not murder, not, not kill, and it should be translated, thou shalt not commit murder. So what we have is the translations kind of lead us into a blind area where we can't see very clearly what it's all about. So we have to use the Bible to let it define for us, and that's going to, what we're going to do here. Let's look at the laws against them in the various dispensations. In Genesis 9-5, we have the patriarchal system. This is after Noah came out of the ark, and he is told, and he is to teach his family this, and they're to teach their family. That means everybody on the earth because they're all descendants of Ham, Shem, or Japheth. Shem was probably the oldest, and then Ham and then Japheth probably the youngest. Uh, my genealogy is by and large from Japheth. Europeans are descendants by and large of Japheth. And uh, so what we have here is we got that message through Japheth, our father, and that was passed on throughout the nations, all the nations that came out of that. And the scripture says in Genesis 9, 5, and surely your blood, the blood of your lives. Now notice, blood of your lives. The implication is, if you scratch yourself, it, you shed some blood, but it didn't shed, it caused you to end your life. So it's the blood of your lives here, blood that's shed to the point that you die. So the term shedding blood is used for murder or for killing someone. So, and surely your blood, the blood of your lives, will I require at the hand of every beast, will I require it. So now if, if, I'm, if I have a cat and he scratches me and I bleed, I don't kill him. He hasn't killed me, see. So, but if a, if a lion comes and eats a human, we kill that lion because we don't want them to know, and God's decreed it, but we don't want them to know that we're weak and that they can eat us. So we don't want them learning that. God decreed it here in this passage. And a hand of every beast will I require it, and the hand of every and of man, even at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed for, and here's why. Here's why he tells us this. In the image of God made he man. The reason that it's wrong to murder is because everybody is made in the image of God. Now that means no matter what you are, if you're a human, you're made in the image of God. Whatever your race is, we're all descendants of Noah. Every one of us descended through Noah, and this is given to Noah. Every person on the whole earth is a descendant of Noah and, and or his three, and his three sons, 
and their wives, of course. Now, when we look at this, he tells with a timeless principle, an eternal principle, man is created in the image of God. All men are created in the image of God. Therefore, it has always been, always will be, a sin to murder somebody. That's what he's telling us. Now, we don't even have to worry about what dispensation it's in because it applies to all three dispensations just by, by, basically because of this being created in the image of God. But he tells us that an animal is to be put to death, and he tells us here, and we'll be looking at this next Sunday morning in some more detail, but he tells us here, the blood of your lives will I require. So if my cat scratches me and I bleed a little bit, he didn't kill me. I don't kill the cat for that. I may get rid of him because he, he's scratching. I don't like cats anyhow in the in the house. They're they're to they're for the barn to eat the mice and rats. Okay, but uh, anyhow, if he scratches me, he didn't kill me. But if an animal kills us, and we've had in Oklahoma City, we've had dogs like pit bulls that have killed people. And uh, there's, a, there's a penalty for that under the law of Moses. And I believe it should be the same penalty we have here. You have a dog that you know is going to kill people, you have to pin it up or, or kill it, get rid of it. Right here, at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Now we'll expand on this next Sunday morning, the Lord willing. But let's go back here now. Whoso shed of man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Capital punishment is the penalty for murder in the Bible. God decreed that it should be the case. But someone says, but that's not loving. But the same book that says to put these people to death said to love everybody. So what we find here is it is capital punishment is not murder by virtue of this passage here. And other passages we can go through in, the, in the, the New Testament as well, but we'll lay that out in more detail. That's important to remember that. It's not murder. You hear people against capital punishment say, thou shalt not kill. They have no idea what they're talking about. They have not read and studied the Bible and not, don't understand it. Now, as we look at this then, whoso sheddeth man's blood, that's murder. By man shall his blood be shed. So you're to put him to death. Murder is to be put to death. Murder is a, of a human requires the death penalty. The reason that murder is a sin is because, but killing an animal is not, is a, uh, because man is created in the image of God and animals were not. That's the difference. Now we have some people that say you can't kill an animal. I don't believe in abusing animals. But I can kill one and eat it, and there's nothing wrong with it. But if I kill a man and eat him, that's something wrong with that. The murder's wrong. And the Bible doesn't explicitly condemn cannibalism, but I think if you study it carefully, you have to draw the conclusion that it's sinful to be a cannibal. Uh, even a person that has died, I wouldn't eat them, okay? <laughs> but that's another question for another time. Let's look at this in Genesis 9, 6 then. We're created in the image of God. That's why it's wrong to murder. Very simple. From this, we learn that murder is a sin based upon a timeless principle. Man is created in the image of God. That principle is never going to change. Therefore, murder is always wrong. Murder being a sin based upon a timeless principle, we do that it's always a sin to murder. Even animals killed a human would be put to death. You're not to allow them to live. Killing an animal in Genesis 9, 1 and 2, just the verses before this, was not a sin because he gave permission to kill them and eat them. Can eat an animal. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So now they're to be fruitful, multiply and replenish the earth. To fill the earth again, basically what that means. Because they're the only ones left on the earth. There's eight people left. And the fear, verse 2, of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. So you're, you're ruling the animals. And upon every bird of the heavens. 
with all wherewith the ground teemeth and all the fish of the sea into your hand are they delivered. You may eat all of any of these animals. Now the law of Moses forbid eating certain animals. But the patriarchal law did not. So we could eat. I've never eaten crow. I guess I, I, you could eat crow and I just don't want to eat crow. Because they're kind of scavengers too. And I don't like that. I've got reason not to eat them. But uh, basically what we, what we have here is we have permission to eat these animals, to kill them and eat them. And I'm, I think I could make a good case that we're not to be abusive to animals. I think I could make a good case for that before. That would be for another time. Genesis 9.3 says, Every moving thing that liveth shall be food for you. See, it lays it out for us. You may eat any of these things. As the green herb have I given you all. I've given you all of these things. You can eat the herbs, the plants, and the animals. Humans now can eat anything they want to eat. This is patriarchal law. So, this is what he's laying out for us here. The law against murder under the law of Moses. Now let's look at it. We come to the law of Moses, which was given at Sinai, at Mount Sinai, and the Decalogue called the Ten Commandments. Deca meaning ten. Log is logos is from sayings, the ten sayings. And so we have the ten sayings, the ten commandments. In Exodus 20 and verse 13, thou shalt not kill. Again, the translators translated thou shalt not kill, but it should be thou shalt not commit murder. Some of the newer translations actually translated as thou shalt not commit murder. And uh, that probably, that would be clear. But uh, if, I, if I am driving down the road and somebody just darts out in front of me and I can't even see them until they're right there and I kill, hit them and kill them, I killed them. But I didn't murder them. They just jump out in front of me and they may even commit suicide But uh, to do that. But you see, I did I did kill them, but I didn't murder them. I'm not guilty of sin under that condition. So assuming I'm not speeding and drunk or whatever, you know, when I'm driving. So uh, killing is not always wrong. And in fact, we've already laid out that capital punishment is not sin. It's not murder. This does not forbid capital punishment. How do I know? Because the book of Exodus goes on and permits or even commands capital punishment. Not doesn't just permit it, commands it. Premeditated murder is what he's talking about. It was punishable by the death penalty in Exodus 21, verses 4, 12 through 14. He that smiteth a man so that he dieth shall surely be put to death. Now he's going to elaborate on what he's talking about here. And if a man lie not in wait but God delivering in his hand. Now that term is used, has to be defined by the New Testament. In other words, situation occurs that it accidentally occurs. And But then will I point the place where he shall flee. So there were six cities of refuge you could go to. Now they were within about 20 miles of the furthest place in Israel that was a city of refuge. Most people lived within 10 miles of one. And you can walk 10 miles in one day easily. If you're in good shape, it won't be a problem. So most people were within a, maybe a half a day's journey of a city of refuge. So if you accidentally kill someone, you immediately drop what you're doing and go to the city of refuge. You ask for, you ask for uh, the city of refuge, you tell the elders of the city what you've done, and you ask them to try you. And uh, they're going to look at the facts. Now, that, they were all Levite cities. They're supposed to know the law of Moses. And so they were to judge fairly, and they had various rules by which they're going to make a judgment. Now, if they ruled that you were innocent, you still had to stay in the city of refuge until the high priest died. So you weren't just off scot free. You had to stay in the city of refuge until the high priest died. If he lived two more years, you had to stay there two years. You could work and live there, and your family could live with you, but you had to stay within the city of refuge. That, that was kind of like you got a little bit of time, but it was like you're on probation, okay? You're out on parole. And so basically you still have to be watched, all right? 
So, but that's part of the law of Moses. We're not going to spend time on that. But right here, if you smite a man, kill him, and you didn't lie in wait, you go to the city of refuge and flee there. And if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from the, mine altar that he may die. He's fled to the city of refuge, and you determine he did it with guile. He did it with premeditation. And so the evidence is such, and they lay out the kind of evidence you would have, that that man had, you had proof that he hated the person beforehand, and he kills him. Then you, you, you put him to death. So right there, that would be, he's defined for us murder, premeditated murder. You had malice and a forethought. That's what I think our laws read in the United States. You killed him with malice and a forethought, that's first-degree murder. And it should have the, the death penalty for it if they really, truly are guilty. Okay. Now, notice here, the law of Moses laid out very detailed instructions on how to determine whether they're guilty. Very stringent rules. And you don't convict them without evidence, hard evidence. If a man injures a woman so that she has a miscarriage, he has committed murder and, is brought, and, is, and it brought the death penalty. And that, of course, gets into this craziness of, of abortion that our country is involved in. It's murder. And if two men, if men strive together and hurt a woman with a child so that her fruit depart, she has a miscarriage, and yet no harm followed. The, the fruit departs, the, has a miscarriage, and the baby lives. He shall surely be fine. He has to pay a fine, according as the woman's husband shall lay upon him. Now, the husband couldn't just tell him what he had to pay. The judges determined it, and he shall pay as the judges determined. See? The, the husband can say, let's just drop it, or he could say he's got to pay the fine, and the judges laid out the fine. They had a specific fine for this, okay? They didn't just get any value they wanted. And he says the judges have to determine it. So they have to determine that this is the case. And if any harm followed, then thou shalt give life for life. So if the baby is born premature and it dies, then you've murdered somebody, and that's capital punishment. So right there, we see it laid out for us. Right here. You just don't hurt a woman that's pregnant. You just be very careful. You don't injure that baby. You don't kill it. So when we lay it out here, the Old Testament, the law of Moses, in great detail defines murder for us. If an animal killed a human, the animal was to be put to death, Exodus 21. The next chapter in Exodus, remember Exodus 20 is the Decalogue, Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 5 gives the Ten Commandments again, just before they entered the land of Canaan. If an ox gore a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be surely stoned and its flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall be quit. He's quit. The animal did it. He lost his ox. The animal's killed. Because you stoned it, you didn't bleed it, you can't eat it. So they're not going to eat the animal. So the animal doesn't get eaten. So the, the owner of the ox just lost his ox. And that's, that's what you've done. Now, there is something that follows, though. If he knew if he knew the ox was wont to gore, he's prone to gore in the past. He's known it in the past and has been testified to its owner. So not that it happened, but he knows it happened. He knows this animal is a mean animal that may hurt somebody. And he hath not kept it in, but it hath killed a man or a woman. The ox shall be stoned. And its owner also shall be put to death. See, that's pretty serious. You don't keep an animal that's going to hurt people without keeping it in. Now, you could keep the animal, but you got to pin him up. You can't let him out where he's going to hurt anybody. See, so right there we have negligible homicide brought to death penalty. If I killed somebody as a result of negligence. That's pretty serious. Now, our country doesn't put you to death for an eligible homicide. I think it's probably second degree murder. Put them in prison. But uh, that's, that's pretty serious. The law of Moses laid it out for us. 
If I do, if I kill someone as a result of my negligence, I'm guilty. I'm guilty in God's eyes, even even if the law doesn't put me to death. I have sinned. I have committed murder in God's eyes. Negligence on the part of the owner of the animal brought the death penalty for the person owning the animal that killed the human. Exodus 21, 29. Pretty serious. This is the same law as they had under the patriarchal law. Go back to Genesis 9, 5. And surely your blood, the blood of your lives, will I require at the hand of every beast, will I require it. So I'm going to put the animal to death if it kills a human. Now, it doesn't lay out if you own the animal and it kills somebody. That doesn't, isn't spelled out here. But the animal has to be put to death if it killed people. Uh, we, we could have a, an, an animal like a horse, a bull or something like that, or even a cow that could uh, kill people. Uh, a bull is capable of killing you, I guarantee you. A 2,000-pound bull can run you over and kill you and stomp on you, and, and if it got horns, it can kill you real quick. The animals can kill you, and uh, they're capable of doing it. you got to be careful of them if you're worked around animals. I've worked around them all my life, a good portion of my life at least, until I was about 20. The children of Israel were to make a battlement on the roof of their houses. Now, what's a battlement? Well, their houses were flat-roofed. And they would go out onto their houses in the summertime and sleep on the top of their houses. Why? Because it's too hot in the house in the summertime. So they would sleep on the top of the house. So here's the top of the house here, like this podium. They would build a wall, a battlement, that's up like this on this house to keep people from falling off the side of it. That's what a battlement was. Now, they also would walk on top of the houses to go from one street to another. People would walk over top of your house to get from the street over here to the other street. Okay? So the battlement also had a gap in it so people could walk through to the next house. That's, that's what a battlement is. And so this is in Deuteronomy 22, 8. When thou buildest a new house, then shalt thou make a battlement for thy roof, that thou bring not blood upon thy house if any man fall from thence. So you do what you have to do. In Oklahoma City, if you have a swimming pool, you have to have a fence a certain height. I think it's six feet high. So that the children can't see or it makes it hard for them to get over and to get into your swimming pool and maybe drown. I think that's a law here. I don't have a swimming pool, but I think that's a law in Oklahoma City, uh, city ordinance. But uh, it might not be, but I, I'm pretty sure it is. My neighbor has a swimming pool, and he built a fence up that's about this high. And he, he told me that he had to do it for the city ordinance. It makes sense that they have the ordinance. Okay, And uh, this is basically that principle here. I don't object to that ordinance. If you're going to have a pool, don't don't drown anybody. Don't get a little kid to get in there and drown. A little five-year-old kid might want to go swimming, and he can't swim very well, and he drowns. And you didn't keep him out. Didn't do your best to keep him out. The law against murder in the New Testament. Let's go to the New Testament now see what it says. In Romans 13, 8, 13, 9, the patriarchal law has laid out, Thou shalt not murder. The law of Moses laid out, Thou shalt not murder. Paul, the Apostle Paul, quotes the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. He quotes it here, several of the parts of the Ten Commandments. For this, Thou shalt not commit adultery, Thou shalt not kill, Thou shalt not steal, Thou shalt not bear false witness, Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, what we're looking at is thou shalt not kill. This right here. Thou shalt not kill. So the law of Moses said thou shalt not kill. Patriarchal law said thou shalt not kill. Now the same commandment is given in the New Testament. Let me point out here. We'll show this from another lesson later. But when the Old Testament defines a word, that word, that definition holds in the New Testament unless it's redefined. I think we can prove it. 
And so what God is telling us to do, go to the definition of murder in the law of Moses that I've already defined for you and use that definition. You're not to do that. He doesn't even define murder for us. That's not a kill. That's not a commit murder is actually what the Greek actually says. So right here, he is telling us this commandment applies today. We've already shown why it has to apply because of the nature of man. We're creating the image of God and still have. And that's why it's wrong to murder. So when we look at it here now, it's the quote of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and the word kill is not redefined. Therefore, the definition in the law of Moses must be the definition that God intended in the New Testament. And we can prove that from other scriptures to show it later. I intend to do that because that's very critical. This tells us how we use the Old Testament in our study of the New Testament. And that's critical that we understand when we can use it and when we don't use it. Because we can get all mixed up if we take part of it. Some people say we take, take part of the Old Testament, not, not part of it. But there's a reason for it. And uh, the old preachers uh, 100 years ago understood this very clearly. They had figured this all out. But right here, murder is defined, it's laid out for us. Look carefully now. Fonuo, fonuo to kill, slay, murder, or to, uh, to absolutely to commit murder. And that's Slayer, page 657. That's the word that's translated, thou shalt not kill, right here. That's the Greek word. So you shall not kill or murder, and the absolute definition is to commit murder. That's what it means in the, in the uh, Greek language. When a passage in the Old Testament is quoted, the meaning of the words is in the quote are the same as they meant in the original unless the words are redefined. Some words are redefined in the New Testament. Some laws are changed. There are some changes. Not many, but there's a few laws that are changed. Usually they're made stronger under the New Testament. But what we find is the laws are the same unless they're changed, unless they're spelled out as being different. So murder was always a sin. Murder in the patriarchal was a sin. Was sin. Murder in the mosaic was sin. Murder in the Christian was sin. Right here, they all three have the same principle. Murder is a sin. Very clearly now, all three of these systems overlap in this one area. Well, we just laid out several other things from the Decalogue that are still binding today. Every one of those was in the patriarchal we've already shown. So there's a bunch of laws that are for all three dispensations, and they apply to us today. Don't go out and murder anybody. I'm, you're not going to. I don't think any of you would even contemplate it. But I'm just saying it's a sin. It's a sin for which the government has the, very, has the right to execute us for it. Capital punishment is their prerogative. Murder has always been a sin under all three dispensations. Therefore, however murder is defined in the, either the patriarchal or the mosaic dispensation is the correct definition in the Christian dispensation. So we've laid it out. We're going to give some more definition of murder because we have a lot of people that are, misunderstand this. This applies in principle for all timeless matters that are not redefined in the New Testament. So all of these things given in the 13th and 12th and 13th chapter of Romans, we cited Romans 12, but Romans 13 lays it out in more detail. But we don't have time to go through that. Murder did not preclude capital punishment. Keep that in mind. And surely your blood, the blood of your lives, will I require at the hand of every beast, will I require it, and a man, even at the hand of every man's brother. Now, we're going to see there's a difference in the execution of the capital punishment under the patriarchal, mosaic, and Christian dispensations. But there still was capital punishment, and it was ordered by God. And God wouldn't order us to sin. Murder is a sin, so capital punishment is not, not murder if the person is truly convicted and truly guilty. And we need to have good evidence for it. But that's the only if. Now, when we study this, 
Genesis 9, 6, Whoso shed of man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. Not just saying God's going to kill him. Man is to put him to death. For in the image of God made he man. Capital punishment has always been decreed by God for murder. Therefore, capital punishment is not murder. Now we'll get into two other situations, self-defense later, and also in warfare. But we'll do, we'll do the warfare next Sunday. But look at that. Uh, so several of the men in here served in the military. And uh, so if you served in the military, I believe that we can defend our country. I believe the Bible will teach that. Murder is a sin because man was created in the image of God. Murder has always been a sin under all dispensations. Capital punishment is not murder. I think that's pretty clear as we laid this out. If you are not a child of God, in order to become a Christian, you must hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. If you're a child of God who's committed sin, it's public. You need to confess it publicly and re repent and pray and ask for forgiveness. A Christian has to repent, ask forgiveness of God, and God will forgive him if he truly repents and asks for forgiveness. If you're a subject, we're going to sing an invitation song at this time. We're not come as we stand and sing if you're a subject.